All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to your Liberty Radio. We are broadcasting live from the land of endless summer as as we do every Wednesday through Saturday night, 9 p.m. to midnight Eastern. Friday night, of course, means we take your phone calls, or I should say, I take your phone calls. I, of course, am the drizzle, the helmsman of this particular shanty. And uh, today is September 8th, 2023. Welcome back for another Friday night open lines. And uh, I think we might have some anxious callers on the line. So let me see. Let's start getting things set up here. I got to click a few buttons. Ha ha. I see. Ah, I see the update has done some funny things. So I'm going to have to do some fixing on the fly. You guys can't hear Yoni yet, but I can. So let's see. Let's get that fixed. And as soon as I do... The Hyona will be able to start talking so I can concentrate on getting things fixed. Testing, testing, smoke more weeds. Yeah. Smoke more weeds. I got testing, you loud and clear, testing. man. How you doing this uh this Friday night? Well, I would say I'm good, but it's Friday and I got all the bills paid. So I'm telling you, Tony the Tiger. I feel great, Drizzle. Nice. That's awesome. All right, keep talking. I got fixing to do here. All right. Well, as I told you, um, I've actually got uh, four different weeds. That way I can roll uh, a joint, uh, which I call a Neapolitan joint. You know, kind of like when you get the ice cream that's got the chocolate and vanilla and strawberry you know um but in this case it'll be all mixed into one joint but the way i like to do it i i, I put it each in its own little section that's why as i'm smoking down the joint it changes flavors um yeah man. and you know i, I gotta say it it started on Tuesday and now Friday. I I, I did some working over in Charleston again. And um Oh yeah. Fuck man. Now I'm gonna say about well, because you know Charleston is the capital of West Virginia and so it's a very blue, very democratic city. I mean there's mm -hmm. literally bumper stickers on people's cars that say Biden twenty twenty four. It's Are you mind serious? Blowing. Already? Mind blowing. Fucking mind blowing. Dude, and so, so of course, how do they even know? How do they know he's even going to make it to, to the campaign next year? Like we, we got months, we got months before we can even get there. And it's not like he's, you know, 42 years old. Come on. But if you're Let's a be realistic, with if you're a shit lib, you can believe beyond all belief. I I don't know. I don't know. Uh, well, nevertheless, I you know I pull up to the Exxon gas station there, uh, right off Corridor G in downtown Charleston, and I see this Subaru Outback. Shout out Paul Hogan, Crocodile Dundee man, and anyways, uh. Yeah, there's the Biden 2024 sticker. So I go in, and there's three people in there. One's got long hair and a Harley Davidson jacket. That's not that. That's definitely not. That's not the super. That's not super. Another dude, big afro and everything. He's got the Malcolm X T-shirt. No offense, I'm not racially profiling, but. That motherfucker did not drive the Subaru with the goddamn Biden bumper sticker. Then I look over to the counter. There's a motherfucker wearing an N95 mask and then a custom cloth mask 
over top the N95 mask. Double mask. They paid for their shit with the tap of a card thing on their key fob, walked out, gotten that super. Next person pulls in, gets out, he's got fucking colored hair, and, and it's wearing a mask. You're shitting me. And I'm like, I got to get out of here, man. I got to get out of here. And, you know, I, I even had, you know, I was going to buy a drink and chips. And when they walked in, I literally just put the chips down and everything. And said, you know, I, I'll I'll do business somewhere else because I'm, I'm really busy. And this is really giving me a panic attack. I'm having an anxiety now because it's there. It, it, it's the, too many fucking NPCs at one time, man. I, I just. Like these automatrons at the fucking president's exhibit. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. just, oh my God. It's just too much at one time, man. I had to. And so I'm like, I'll just go down, you know, go down to the downtown Charleston Mall there at the Riverwalk. And right on the riverbank, you know, where people bicycle and jog and everything. Mm-hmm. Thinking, you know, I can finally relax or smoke me a cigarette, wait for my next rider to bling in on my Uber app here. God damn, here they come running down the fucking sidewalk, jogging. Two men with the shorts that actually only meet at the waistband on the hips. <laughs> and so it's kind of like 1982 men NCAA men's basketball shorts vibes 1982 men's basketball shorts vibes definitely but anyways their their masks are puffing both of their masks are puffing because they're jogging fucking outside with masks on that was five and a half hours ago you're fucking kidding me Dude, I went I went to the market this morning because that's what I typically do on Friday mornings, right? Like that's that's when I go and I get the groceries for the week is Friday morning. Dude, I didn't see anybody wearing a mask. Now, again, granted, I don't know what the the television is saying down here in Acapulco because I don't watch TV. I don't I don't listen to the local media at all. Like I no, I just don't do it. All all my information I get online. So if I'm going to listen to something Spanish language, it's something that I have sought out, you know. It's not just well, you know, like I would filtering in. right now is going to be in many ways similar to what happened the first time this thing rolled out and through its duration in in that it's a patchwork <laughs> and depending upon what city and what state and what county you're in, there's going to be different levels of tyranny and bullshit to deal with. Like, so for example, just take the example of the state of Oregon, right? So if you're in bum fuck ass Eastern Oregon, like the part that's over next to Idaho, you know, big red Trump country, you know, I don't see them doing the masks. They never really did embrace the masks and shit. But if you're on the other side of the Cascade Range, right down there by the coast, by, you know, the Willamette Valley and Salem and Portland, Oregon and all that shit. Well, I mean, that's basically a, a hive of shit liberty there. Mm. Um, on the great Columbia river there. And, and you can just keep going on up I five all the way into SeaTac there, you know, Seattle and Tacoma and all that. Um, it's all blue country there. And, and I, again, same thing in Atlanta around Emory university and the CDC, we're seeing the same because it's 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 being pushed through the hospital system as it was before. You know, it began with well, you have to wear the mask when you're at the ER because there's super duper turbo sick people here. 
Um, and you don't want to get the turbo cooties and stuff, you know. Warp speed koofy cooties. Very dangerous. Very and And now, I'm hoping that one day I'll actually hear people talking between themselves. This BNT 1161.4 is not as bad as the BNT 1161.3. Right. Well, I mean, that will that will all eventually come out because I mean that's all part of the script, honestly. Uh, but can't see... they be more creative, Drizzle? I mean, no. we've got the CDC. Why should they? They have a script, and we've got the National Institutes of Health and National Allied Infectious. Center. You know, NIAID and NIH and CDC. All these minds here. Why can't they take cues from, you know, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the good folks over at the National Hurricane Center mm. and think of some different names for the variants as they come out? You know, the, the, the same way as whenever the tropical depressions are burped off of the Saharan plains of Africa into the mid-Atlantic. And then they swirl around, and the next thing you know, Hurricane Lee is formed. And right now, it is the strongest hurricane they've ever recorded on planet Earth right now. Sustained winds over 170 miles an hour, wind gust over 200 miles an hour. If there was a Category 6 hurricane, it's it. Because it's the strongest mm -hmm. and biggest hurricane they've ever recorded. It could hit New York or Boston. We'll see. We'll see. Um so that's legit, way, it being the strongest ever recorded? Uh-huh. Okay. So much Not surprising. shit happening with the weather lately with these. Mm -hmm. Like, remember the fire NATO that hit Maui? It's almost like, um, I don't know, maybe something that, that helps to regulate the uh, weather systems on the planet is, um, I don't know, like weakening or something. Huh. Well. It's the AMOC. It's 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 the uh, Atlantic Mid Ocean Current. Could be. It's, it's slowing. Down. Could be the magnetic field. It could be the suns. You know, it could be a bunch of different things. You know, there, there's definitely a whole not. lot of solar magnetic plasmogism just splooging yeah. through the galaxy these days, and and it's been measurable. I mean, you, you could see it. It was enhancing the Aurora Borealis or Northern Lights. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, I can't see it. I'm amazing, too far south. Amazing fucking sunsets here lately, too, because oh, of yeah. like the oh. dust, that, the mm -hmm. Saharan dust. And then there was also all this. Um, Dude, we have been getting. Speaking some of freak wildfires, there was also a bunch of freak wildfires around New Brunswick. And Nova Scotia, Canada, over on the other side of like where it borders the state of Maine. Right. You know, um, and the weirdest thing is. Now, this is going to sound conspiratorial, but I'm just saying, like looking at the, the pictures of the flames and then the burn patterns in the aerial photos afterwards. And there's these literally circular fucking burn marks, like they're burning fucking stone hinges. Hmm. Uh, and the only other place I've seen those circular burns and circular fires is uh, Maui and in Hawaii. Hmm. Interesting. I'm like, what are the fucking chances of that? And then people being incinerated in their cars. But then, like, literally, the street they're on, all the bushes and, like, trees and shit all around the buildings intact, down to the leaves. Yeah, just fine. Leaves are on the tree. But the yeah, building... Not even singed. Fucking ashy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, like, there's a precise... But... No, no, yeah, I, I'm gonna stop. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna we're stop. just speculating here. Uh, yeah, just spe I mean, we're not on we're not on wild, YouTube, so we don't have to worry about it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but 
Phytophiliac <laughs> is uh, also uh, on the call. And Fido, whenever you want to jump in, feel free because Yona's not going to give you a chance. You're just going to have to kind of jump in on the conversation whenever, just whenever, you know, pretty you much. You guys are just keeping me rolling. I just, I can't, okay. <laughs> I couldn't even jump in. I'm just laughing the whole time. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm just letting you know. And of course that goes for anybody else that wants to call in as well. Uh, the link to the Zoom call is in the Liberty Radio Telegram channel. And at some point, we are uh, expecting B1 to show up and give us a boots on the ground report from uh, Bleeding Man. I'm sorry. I mean, Drowning Man. I'm, no, I'm sorry. I mean, Burning Man. Burning Man. It's called Burning Man. Right? Yes. Okay. Ebola Man. Ebola man. Ebola man? Right. Well, bleeding Ebola. man. I said bleeding man. Ebola. Yeah. By the way, in case you guys didn't know, uh, Larry Sinclair died like five years ago in a hit and run. Uh, Media Monarchy remembers seeing the stories, and Adam Curry on No Agenda actually went into the No Agenda archive and pulled the episode on the live stream he did this he pulled the episode from like five years ago where they talk about larry sinclair dying in a hit and run what do you think about that i don't know who larry sinclair is he's the the guy that's making the rounds on the alleged independent media now saying that he used to be obama's gay lover Oh, but he's supposed to be dead? Yeah. Yeah, he died in a hit and run five years ago. Huh. Wow. I kind of, when I first heard about the so-called Obama gay lover thing, I was like, if that isn't a fake story, I have never heard of one before. It just reeks. That whole thing just reeks. Well, what about the cook? The, the cook for Obama that, that mm, was uh, over, mysteriously apparently. drowned in. Did that you hear about ago. that, Fido? I did hear about that one. Yeah, I heard a lot of speculation about that one, and uh, I'm really not sure how, how to make heads or tails of that one. And I just I don't think I want to touch that one with a 10-foot pole because <laughs> I think it's just another one of those distraction stories because really there's – there's nothing but speculation going on around that particular story. There's really no facts that are being um, dished out. You know, um, uh, Fido, uh, I'm glad you brought up 10 foot pole. You think we'll see big Mike Obama run for president? Maybe. <laughs> AKA Michelle. No, maybe Nancy will run. Well, she's gone. Oh, she's she's she she's wanting today. to jump she's, back into the into yeah. politics. She's she's done with retiring. I guess she yeah, yeah, she got yeah. tired of her. She husband. tried it out and it just wasn't for her. So she was like, All right, well, I'm just gonna go back to doing what I know how to do, which is fleecing the public. Oh, I got the perfect dream team ticket. Nancy Pelushi and Die Fi. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. All girl party. All girl party, you know what I'm saying, and 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 at least three good eyes. <laughs> they could, uh, they could, they I mean, could win with the nursing home ticket. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, Fido, Fido, you know what I'm saying, and and what's up, my homie? Uh, uh, RBLs in the house. Uh, if we're gonna have a gerontocracy. Let's let's just go with the whole die five bulging eye gerontocracy. Fucking wear it with pride. Own that shit. Yeah. Might as well. <laughs> Free briefs for everyone. What up, fam? Yo, 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 what you doing? I just finished my shift. I'm about to go do karaoke. Oh, oh yeah. You're gonna have to record that. Get somebody to record it. Nah. Uh, no, you don't want that recorded. <laughs> we have, it's for posterity, okay? It, it might get recorded. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it might happen, but 
it, it's not going to be anything that anybody ever wants to hear again. <laughs> <laughs> one time's enough. That's all we need. We just need one time. <laughs> Someone yeah, asked me, do I, you do karaoke? Have somebody I think I take some it video. Out, RBL. We can make gifs. Oh, there he is. B1 is in the motherfucking building, son. Where's Blam. that? Oh, wow. And he's on the road. Well, I think I can handle up to 100 people, so uh, this could get interesting. Wow. Is, is, he, is he just now leaving the Nevada desert? <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> About handling 100 people. Oh, at okay. One time. <laughs> oh, wow. It's a little bit of a delay there, Ando. <laughs> well, the funny part is Ando's not high. Yep. I, I got to be sober. I just drove a truck. Uh, Ando, I, I believe that link you're looking for is um, Debbie Does Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> dude there was a magazine back in the 90s i remember this because i worked at a grocery store um that some girl decided to take as many dicks in a row as she possibly could i think the number was over uh, over 200 wow and i cannot imagine Jesus. getting lasties on that lasties on that would be terrible wow well on that oh, note uh, B1 Music is officially uh, on the call. All right. Uh, can you hear us, B1? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can, loud and clear. How you doing this evening? Speaking of taking 200 dicks, that's probably what it sounds like right now. I'm, I'm, I'm driving. <laughs> so I, I apologize for the noise. That's all right. We'll fix it in post. <laughs> Doing it live. Yeah, good to be with you guys, man. Woohoo! It's good to have Woo. you. So uh, you survived the extinction level event that was Burning Man. Um, what, what can you tell us about what you experienced on the ground in Black Rock City? Oh, my God. You know... If there's one thing we haven't learned from the last couple of years, it's that the news exaggerates things. They like to sensationalize and make things a little bigger than they are. But Burning Man is pretty fucking big. So it's hard to uh, exaggerate that. Because really, if you haven't been to Burning Man, I, there's nothing I can do that will help you understand what it is. It's massive. It's like the biggest scale event there is. Event outside of a city, you know, there's no infrastructure there, so they got to build the whole thing. But, yeah, as, as far as the, uh, the narrative going around right now about the whole weather phenomenon and the, the Burning Man turning into Mud Man, that, that is pretty real, yeah. It, it wasn't extinction level. It wasn't life-threatening for a lot of people because most people out there, we prepare, we bring all the food and everything that we need. But the weather, if there's one thing I, I could tell you, it's that, you know, people in our circle know about artificial weather. We know about weather manipulation and all this. And I saw it was pretty fake. Yeah. That, uh, you broke up on us just a minute. Figured. Yeah, hold yeah, on. Yeah. I'm sorry, Rizzle, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, can you repeat that last part, B1? You you were breaking up on us. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there's uh, there was definitely some weather fuckery going on. Okay. There was some, art, some artificial weather happening. You know, the uh, forecast for the week, when I, when I, when I was getting there, the forecast said sunny the entire week, 80 to 90 degrees during the day, sunny, even though it had just rained the week before uh, a, a little bit. There had been some puddles on the ground. But despite that clear forecast, 
on the Thursday night, I noticed a bunch of, uh, oh, you know, plain streaks across the sky out there. And I know there's not air traffic in that area. It's a pretty remote area. There should not be any, you know, high uh, air, aircraft activity. Activity, but there was there was some artificial clouds happening, and then lo and behold, the next Friday, the next forty eight hours, it fucking poured. It poured rain. It dumped in the middle it of the rained. desert for forty eight hours. In the middle of the desert, yeah, for the next forty eight hours, it freaking dumped. So, uh, Drizzle, I want to cut in with some questions here because I have questions that are chronological, chronological questions to the chain of events for my friend B1 here. And my first question has to do with the, the processional into uh, Black Rock City in that um, there were some shit lib tarted uh climate activists who did actually build a makeshift barricade of sorts across the uh, road into the camp leading you know off of i-80 at sparks and the in and out burger all the way up to where black rock city was constructed which for those that are unfamiliar with burning man black rock city is actually the constellation as it were of all the camps that are arranged around this basically city they build in the desert of northern nevada but anyways um the question being i saw how it was blocked and and the videos were posted of the confrontations at this barricade and then it's dismantling and people moving on and so it looked like it was only a delay of I'm going to say maybe five or six hours. Um, but I don't, I, I'm, so my first question was, were you impacted by the delay of the entrance to Black Rock? Me? No. No, I showed up, I think, right after that had happened. So I just, I just went straight in. Yeah, that didn't affect me at all. And my second question is, on behalf of myself, a dead fella, uh, on the tracks you were able to share with the audience there. Uh, <laughs> were you able to share the one that Deadfella remixed? I did. Yeah. Yona and Deadfella. Yeah. Which is a super rad, kind of heavy techno, like like dark melodic techno type of track. Yeah. It's, it's I, very, very cool. I love working with Deadfella because he has such this dark psychedelic take but it's always on a really really dark level you know um i, I dig yeah. it man. and especially that bubbling bass you threw on that uh remix we did of uh essence essence of blessings rem desivere song yeah which you know they're, they're using the different name for that now um the brand name for uh, Remdesivir is like Veclury, Veclury or something. Yeah, yeah, that's it, right? Oh, like V E K L U R Y. Correct. Yeah. You get yeah. a gold star for spelling. <laughs> yeah, shout out that fella, my homie. All I right. have a question for you, B one. What was your favorite part of the whole thing? Favorite part of Burning Man? Yeah. Oh, oh shit. Uh, you know, I'm still processing it. It usually takes some time coming back to the real world. It's a bit of a shock. But uh, I got to say, it's just the people. You know, it's it's the people that make Burning Man. You know, all, there's, of course, all this mind-blowing art and building that happens and just just crazy shit you see out there but for me it's the people i just met some absolutely beautiful vibrant people that you just don't so that's that's my favorite part yeah so uh have you been taking any special medication to deal with your exposure to the <laughs> mud considering you may have the 
purple gonorrhea, syphilitis, Ebola, coronavirus? <laughs> you know, uh, I got all my vaccines, so I'm, I'm up to date. No, just kidding. I don't. No, I uh, take my chances out there. You know, <laughs> a lot of uh, I mean, sunshine, a lot of hydration, and I'm good. You know, if, if you want me to be one, I can uh, I can clip up some of this hyperbolic stuff. Because, you know, while Burning Man was going down, I kept uh, pestering Drizzle with DMs of all these different links of hyperbolic story after hyperbolic story about Burning Man. And the whole time I'm like, dude, B1's there, man. I wonder if B1 was held up in this roadblock. And then, oh, my God, I wonder if B1's fucking drowning. I was just joking when I said, you know, get it moist out there, man. You know you know what I'm saying? You're going to be in the desert, get it moist. And the next thing you know, fucking chemtrails and everything in the sky, and they're dropping bariums and salts and fucking seeding the fucking clouds. and and despite all of that, what people fail to realize, I think, in the story and the coverage and everything is the community of people that that go to Black Rock City. Because this isn't the first or second or third or fourth Burning Man. I mean, you know, it's not their first rodeo. And so just the caliber of people there generally speaking, would have been, you know, in my estimation, the best people you could possibly want to have to deal with some type of adversity like that. Because, I mean, after all, Black Rock City is all about community building. You know, I mean, they're literally building a community in the desert. So, I mean, when it comes to uh, community building exercise, nothing builds like adversity when people have to pull resources and everything. And I mean, I I saw several good stories of, you know, there was one kitchen serving Vietnamese pho, but I mean, you know, like B1 was trying to explain to people the scale. Cause you know, I was looking at the maps of the camps and everything. And, you know, I, cause I can think like a surveyor, but you know, for people for scale, if you could imagine an entire NFL arena with all of the parking lots going all the way around it. Okay. That's about one quarter of the land area. So, so imagine four NFL um, stadiums oh, dude, bigger, bigger with all the parking lots that, that flank all the way around all four of those stadiums, all set side by side. And that's just the camps that ring the main playa where you've got, you know, the art and, you know, the burning man and stuff. I mean, is that a pretty accurate, because it's kind of, you know, in an, like a half moon shape as it kind of fans out. And then you've got these aisles and rows. And, and, and is that pretty accurate, B1? You're not too far off. Yeah, you know, it. you're absolutely right. It is the best people to be out there with. Everybody's a tough motherfucker and become prepared for two weeks with all kinds of food and stuff. But as far as the size, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking like, prob- I'm not exaggerating, probably a hundred NFL stadiums. I don't know about the parking lots because they might be different sizes, but I'm thinking like a hundred stadiums. All, you know, like there, it's more than a square mile. It's like a square mile and a half maybe even two miles once you get out, like, around it. But, like, it's, it's fucking big, man. It's a pop-up city. It's the third largest city in Nevada for one week out of the year. Well, I, I think it takes up about 1,200 acres, which a uh, square mile is 640 acres. So it's essentially, from what they've got mapped out, uh, basically two square fucking miles. Which is, you know, I mean, that's yeah. bigger than San Francisco for, by, by comparison in terms of land area. Yeah, yeah. Like, everyone has a, has a bicycle because you just, you just can't get around. You just can't even see 2% of it, even with a bicycle. Like, it's just massive. Well, what plus it's so flat. These, what if all of these um, uh, setups with Burning Man, all these repeat setups, what if that is something that is conditioning people? For 15-minute cities. 
Just That's a, a very good point. I have I have no doubt there is uh, a lot of experimentation and programming and conditioning happening at Burning Man. It's the perfect opportunity. It is the CIA's wet dream, you know, like or whatever kind of a group that like that likes to influence. It's a wet dream for them. It's a it's an experimental city. They can just go and do whatever. And it's been very known for a long time that the intelligence agencies, and especially corporations, and of course, you know, all these famous tech CEOs go out there to kind of pilot these ideas. And just just for an instance, or just for uh, one example, like I know uh, Elon Musk's, or Elon Musk has been there several times, but Elon Musk's brother now owns and has some influence over the uh, drone show, which is like one of the world's largest drone shows. It's over a thousand drones. It's making all these symbols in the sky. And it's just kind of like, it's, you know, if, if anybody knows anything about mass rituals, it's all about getting as many people as possible to focus on one thing. It's, you know, energy flows where the attention goes. And if 80,000 people are all focusing on the same thing, it's very powerful. And that's what happens at Burning Man. You know? That's that's so true. Hello. <laughs> hey Stella. Yeah. Welcome How you to doing? Liberty Radio. Hey Stella. Thank you. Hey Fido. Hello. I'll see you, nice Stella. I'll nice see to meet you, man. <laughs> yeah, um, just talking about what um, the gentleman was just saying. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. B one. B one. You got hey. it. Hey. Hey. Hello. Um, what he was just saying about. Yeah, focusing collective energy, that's so true. It's its so ritualistic. Um, and I, I, the other thing I've sort of speculated on is whether Burning Man was really a CIA project from the start. Very well could be, you know. Pure know, speculation. I know about the original story that we're told. It's a, it's a guy named uh, Harvey, or sorry, Har Harvey or Harley, yeah, uh, out in San Francisco, and they – some guy got cheated on and they wanted to like burn an effigy of the guy that cheated, that who basically fucked his wife. And uh, so they went out on the beach in San Francisco and burned a statue of this guy to say like, ah, oh, fuck you, like whatever, get over it. And it just happened to be so fun. They kept doing it. But okay. that's viable. <laughs> nowadays, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I have no doubt that it, it's been sanctioned by the government, let's just say. Because you can't put on an 80,000 person event without serious uh, approval and cooperation with law enforcement and all that. You know, B1, yeah. we, uh, B1, we could start our own festival. And instead of burning a man, we could burn a large owl. Oh, hey. I think I've heard about that somewhere. It's been done, buddy. Yeah, oh. I think that's oh. trademarked, Yona. Oh, Somebody yeah. owns the rights to that already. <laughs> Hang on, I, 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 go, go back to B1. I, I, I've got to think of something else. What All right, else well, you got? I, I got a question. Maybe, maybe I got a if question, we built a large B1. wooden badger. Do what? What, Fido? Maybe if we built a large wooden badger. Yeah, I was thinking groundhog, maybe. <laughs> I could marmot. Marmot. Drizzle. It's got to be a marmot. Marmot. We got Giant no Monty Python fans in the, in the audience here. <laughs> No, marmot for the win. We've we've That's already right. got like a, a marmot product line that we can latch on to. We'll make I know. tons of money and, off and, of and it. We a, and we have a and we have a marmot artist there with the AM Wake okay. Up crew with uh Ainge oh. there. Exactly. The merch. <laughs> yeah. It's all about the merch. All right, so Fluffy B1. Thorns. B1. Uh <laughs> I have been dying to know this because no one else in the media seems to to know how uh this was taken care of. How did they manage to get rid of Ebola so quickly? Ebola? Yeah. There was an Ebola uh, outbreak at Burning Man. Didn't you know that? FEMA showed up. They cordoned off like a, a whole portion of the thing with like these big black fences. And they were in the hazmat suits carrying people out on stretchers. People were bleeding out of their eyeballs. Yeah, you didn't hear about any of that. If that's not an exercise. Yeah, this reminds me. They, they asked the Amish people during COVID, like, hey, why don't you guys get COVID? And their response was, we don't watch TV. 
exactly. <laughs> I, I guess I must have missed it because I, I just wasn't watching the news. So it didn't exist to me. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't hear anything about Ebola when I was there. Now, there, there's there's one other story that made the rounds be one. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to step on anybody there. It, just about Chris Rock. Because um, the poor fella, <laughs> you know, after all the stuff with Will Smith and, you know, keep my wife's name out your motherfucking mouth and the slap heard around the world, whether or not it was a real slap or not. Moving on, Chris Rock was there with the blue baseball jacket and everything. And apparently uh walked uh several miles until someone gave him a ride in a pickup truck to get out of there and his main complaint was that the the porta johns uh were not being emptied and it was just really gross and nasty getting <laughs> to and from the porta johns and the porta johns themselves and stuff so um <laughs> of course fresh off my latest um music masterpiece I pooped on myself. Uh, my, my question hinges on um, the poop at, at Black Rock City. Uh, what, did you have problems pooping there, B1? Uh, I didn't have any problems. You know, my, my bowel movements are pretty pretty smooth and consistent nowadays. But uh, as far as the Port of Johns, that, that was probably the biggest humanitarian crisis there was like, they just couldn't get big trucks in to service those things for two days. And they did back up. They, they were a bit nasty, I will, I will say that. And uh, at the end of those two days, after Friday and Saturday, you know, Sunday, when the sun came out, we started seeing all these people emerge from their tents with just gallons of piss <laughs> and, like, big jugs of piss because everybody was just pissing in their tent. You know, like, why would you want to walk out in the mud to go pee when you could just hang out in your tent and pee in a jar or whatever? I, so I, I would was, like to think that cool. was done as a solidarity with the Amazon workers at fulfillment centers, B1. <laughs> yeah. What, what were they doing with the piss when they were walking out with jugs and jugs of it? Uh, they were, were they empty? Free, free drinks, free free samples. No, um, <laughs> they, they, they just went to the Port of Johns to empty them. Oh, you know, I see. Like, everybody would go dump them eventually because. Wow. Yeah, the one cool thing about Burning Man is that everybody does respect the land quite a bit. And uh, there's no trash, really. Like, there are no trash cans anywhere. So everybody's responsible for taking care of their own trash. And they're pretty, pretty good about it. It's the only place I've ever seen in America where people will stop what they're doing to pick up a piece of trash on the ground, even if it's not theirs, especially if it's not theirs. They'll just see something and go pick it up. So that's yeah, pretty I, much I, what was happening. I just want to remind people that uh, there's a reason why I'm known as El Corresponsal, the correspondent uh, for Liberty Radio News. And that's because, as Drizzle knows, with my grounded history, I ask the hard hitting questions and, and we get the information that all the viewers want to know um, all the way down right to the nitty gritty and all the shit you need to know about. Yona, Drizzle, Liberty Radio News coverage. Right here, folks. Uh, back to you, B1. Uh, my follow-up question would be... So um, let me clip that. When it came to the exodus or the recessional, um, was there an issue with the road surface getting out of there? Because, I mean, we're talking about a massive amount of traffic. And, and I mean... Surely they had some type of gravel oh, or yeah. some type of improved road for everyone to be able to use to get out of there and not have to drive through mud. Uh, absolutely not. There is no gravel. There's no altering the landscape whatsoever. That's very prohibited. So it's, it's what you what you get is what you get. It, it's all mud. But the cool thing is, is that it's a desert. So when the sun co comes out, everything dried pretty darn quickly oh you know that's that's great and people seem to forget about that everybody you know the, I, th I think the whole the whole experience was a great filter for all the, the pardon my french the, the bitches who couldn't handle something like that people with bad people who 
were worried about their shoes or worried about their hundred thousand dollar RV. So that was a great like filter because they all freaked out. Yeah. Yeah, but all the guys are off. They freaked out as soon as possible. And that's probably the worst idea because it was still really muddy. And if you just waited a couple hours, it'd be fine. Or like if you do what I did, I just waited two days. And I got to see the burn. I got to see the temple burn. And I got to see everybody leave with a big smile on their face. And there was no problem getting out at that point. And so, so you know, it was awkward to me that the Chris Rock story and coverage was making the round so hot and heavy in the lamestream media, considering the fact that due to the funky weather, uh, the scheduled burning of the temple and everything was postponed until um i believe it was monday night when it finally uh went up and so uh the chris rock thing was uh sunday so you know here the, you got these people that fucking bailed before the thing was ever finished yeah. so you know like fuck them you know what i'm saying I, that that would be my opinion yeah. but anyways yeah, it sort yeah, of vanished. Toward, towards the end, I mean, it was great. Everybody who was left standing was like all on the same page. We were all like, hey, we just went through two days of some crazy shit. Now we can all relax and do it proper. I'm so glad that we're all yeah. here. What a bonding experience, I would think. That was it. Totally. Totally. It was yeah. amazing. It would be. Yeah, by that stage, a lot of people would have been filtered out, as you say. Um, I did read somewhere that... Um, there's a lot of bikes, like push bikes, like hundreds of push bikes, piles of them left over at the end. Is that true or is that just more tainting of the event? Uh, that is true, you know? but that's also the same every year. Like a lot of people just bring bikes out there and they get lost or people will take them and then ditch them or whatever. Because they're tripping and they walk back and forget that they rode. <laughs> yeah, or, you know, they just forget where they park their bike and they just – lose it somehow so the, yeah. every year there is a lot of leftover bikes and don't worry about that they go to a, a charity or there's an organization right outside in the, in, the, in the nearest town that stores these bikes and then has them all for free the next year for people right yeah so, i figured that, that there would be something recyclable going on instead of just the, the bit that you hear that sounds bad <laughs> for sure you know, B1, yeah, I have uh, one final question for you, B1, um, uh, related to the Burning Man there. And that is um, the really the most entertaining, the, the cutest little uh, video that I saw in terms of coverage, uh, which, you know, it was actually pretty banal and boring. But to me, it was cute because uh, you had this uh, NBC crew uh, from the local Reno affiliate went down Interstate 80 to the parking lot of the In-N-Out Burger and Sparks, which for, for those that are not familiar, <laughs> when the Burning Man is over and people leave Black Rock City, the journey is all about getting down to Interstate 80, at which point you can either head east or head west, back to the west coast or the east. Either way, and when you get to Interstate 80, first major spot is the in and out Burger there. And so that's like a major uh, stopping point for everyone pouring out of the festival as, as the first place to, you know, actually get a fresh cheeseburger and shake or fries or whatever. The point being, so we got this NBC crew from Reno and they're there in the parking lot and they're showing like you can see where every single car is pulled up and the people have gotten out and gone in or or whatever, uh, like like the family circle cartoons, you know, where, where it leaves the little dash of light because of the mud falling off of people's shoes and the mud falling off their clothes and the mud falling off their vehicles. There was this, this, you know, mud and, and dust and, and just dirt all over the parking lot. And the, uh, uh, the, the, the news crew from Reno there, the NBC journalisms as a, a journalist, this is, is, uh, they're like doing, uh, 
camera close-ups of each piece of mud in the parking lot and just going on and on <laughs> about the mud. And th to me, it was just cute and hilarious because it's like, how fucking far can you take this hyperbole, hyperbolic, just over the top, oh my God, and look at how large this piece of mud is. <laughs> and it's just littered all over this parking lot. Pieces of mud everywhere. God forbid. Back to you in the studio. <laughs> oh, the humanity, not the mud. Oh, what are we going to do? Mud. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Whoever How did we survive? Thing. What is this world coming to? There's mud in the parking lot. <laughs> in and out burger. What are we going to do? Oh. Is so, my question was crisis? Did you ever stop at the Sparks Nevada In and Out Burger? I did not because the line was probably way too long. I did stop in Sparks for some uh, Vietnamese pho, actually. And uh, that was delicious. And as I usually do, I stop again right on top of the Sierras at the, the highest point of the Yuba River. And I spent the the second half of the day just bathing in the river. It was absolutely gorgeous. And, you know, I, I also have to highly recommend, you know, whenever you're thirsty and want some soup, you can very easily just do a little search on your phone and find a Vietnamese place and go follow yourself. <laughs> as i usually do yeah it was absolutely the best way to end that epic journey yeah for those that haven't had vietnamese pho soup it's like really like like if you the only thing i would find like even similar in u.s soups would maybe be like a bone broth type thing with maybe big chunks of pork and then like vegetables and noodles but it's got that bone broth like um i i don't know it's it's fucking amazing a anyways i'm sorry go ahead b1 how many times have you been <laughs> to burning man b1 uh this is my third time and by far the best actually it was the best time so what, well, what about it says this a lot. time made it the best? Uh, well, like, I mean, probably, other than the other than the the monsoon, obviously. Like, let's take that out of the equation. Right. Comparing it to the other two, like, what what is the separating factor? Well, for me, it's it's probably a more personal reason because this time I had such a great camp such a great community of people to be stuck with. Like uh, the last, last, I mean, the, the first time was extremely cool. It was amazing, a mind blowing experience. The second time I was with a camp with not so great people and it, it burning man was amazing, but I had to kind of leave the camp to go have fun. Most of the time, this time it was just the people, the people really make it. Um, yeah. And they're just a group of amazing people basically i couldn't have asked for a better group of people to be stuck with you know so if, if anyone out there is ever uh contemplating going to burning man go with the best people you could possibly find and you'll have yourself the best time um or, or actually i mean it I, I guess it is what you make it you could probably show up with nobody and still find your tribe you know and still have a great time regardless but uh it's it's probably just you know just same as uh life the rest of life you know surround yourself with good people and life will be a lot better you know b1 i really have to say on behalf of myself dead fella and my mother's entire tribe I mean, it, it tickles me to no end to know that uh you know the cherokee music that i've made with the cherokee language that, you know, that that was uh, exposed to a larger audience, you know, because I mean, I know that there's a lot of electronic dance music out there already of a, I mean, there's a whole genre called tribal electronic, you know, um, but I don't know how much actually has 
Cherokee language in it. You know, I mean, I know there's like Deep Forest and Enigma and some other acts. If you go back through time that were electronic, that had some like Native American stuff. And of course, today, you know, th there are several acts, particularly in Canada, uh, that, uh, you know, are, re you know, really pioneers and, and leaders in electronic music and using their Native American languages of Cree and, uh, you know, Anishinaabe and, and other Algonquin languages. But I, you know, I really haven't heard any Cherokee language in, in music at all. I mean, there, there is very, very, very little to be found. And so when you told me that you were at Burning Man, and going to be playing music, I was like, oh, my God, man. Because I, I know, like, three or four that I shared with you um, have uh, mm -hmm. Cherokee in it. I mean, uh, one of them I'm actually singing, the one with Maya Angelou. And then there's another Maya Angelou track that I made, the one that I made for James Evan Pilato and Media Monarchy, which he actually then used on Media Monarchy, which, which is – the one, uh, the acoustic version is called the Vitamin B1 Deficient Remix because I expect one of these days you have a chance to um, take that stripped down version, which is just basically the vocals and uh, the piano and nothing else um, for your own take on on what you want to do with that. Um, that that's got that's going to be exciting. Absolutely. And, and also look forward to uh, uh, now that I, I've got the tracks back, because I sent all of the separate tracks for the Joe Biden song to Dead Fella. And he just got that back to me uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday. Uh, and I've got all that now with the uh, compressed vocal master and everything for um, Fart Noise. I pooped myself. Sucks both dicks remix. Um <laughs> and, and I'm thinking now that I've got the dead fella masters and I was like, now I got to remix it again. And I'm like, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. I'll just send it to B1. Cause I mean, it, when you hear the music, when you hear the, the, the 808s and the bass and the harmony and like the music, just never mind the vocals and all the fart noises at first, um, just the music part of it. I, I was really thinking like it, it reminded me of that one that I remixed of uh, PM Dawn, where you made the music video with the the little kid playing the uh, battleship and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, You're the B one. Yeah. Yono, when yeah. you say the eight oh eight, are you are you talking about the old dramatics? Yeah. Oh, I love that thing. You've already bought. Yeah, I'm already sold, and I haven't even heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Good fun. Yeah. So just just know, Yona, that uh, there was some serious mud wrestling happening while I was playing your tunes out. You know that that memory is burned into my mind. Is I I, I did get to play my music and DJ at a couple different locations, and uh, awesome. one of them was, was was just during the rain. You know, like the one of those last days. I think it was Saturday when it was sprinkling, kind of on and off. Things were clearing up enough to where we could run the generator and put on some sound. Fuck yeah. Uh, I did, and I I put on a, a bunch of shit that I a bunch of really kind of left field stuff as well as some like hard hitting dance beats. Um, but people people like love the the eclectic kind of music. So I was putting on like my friend gave me the whole list of like uh, folk songs in different languages. It's like old Swiss folk songs, a Russian one, like a a folk song from Thailand, folk song from Africa, like all these. Uh, different oh, that, languages. That, that's the type of shit I'd be remixing. Yeah, that, that's my and type people, of shit. As you know, man, absolutely loved know. it. And and a lot yeah. of my songs are mixing different languages, like that Nigohi loan, which is pretty much Cherokee mixed with um Kabali music from Pakistan. Nusrat Fatih Ali Khan. Yeah. And the video's got the Peyote tribe there in Mexico and shit. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of my mission, really, with my musical endeavor is to give people some things they haven't heard before, you mm -hmm. know, 
and uh, there's a lot of ubiquitous house beats and trance music happening out there, and it gets a little boring to me. I can only take so much, but then that's my that's my job is to mix it up and give people some things they haven't heard. And every time that I would play some of those pieces of music, it would turn heads. People would go, "What the hell? What is that? What language are they speaking? Wait a minute, that's a cool beat I never heard before." You know, <laughs> and I'd be like, "Oh yeah, that's that's my homie Yona. That's that's a Cherokee Grandmaster out there." And wherever you are, West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> Yona. And yeah, and then they'd be mud rustling and doing the, doing the Burning Man shenanigans that they do. Um, but that that will forever stick in my mind, man. I'll, I'll never forget these these mud filled moments playing some of your music and people just just going ham. Well, I told yeah. Dead Fella, uh, I told Dead Fella before you came on that, uh, you know, after the show, uh, I would uh, figure out from you <laughs> um, uh, which tracks uh, uh, you played at Burning Man because we're we're going to put out an EP of that particular selection of songs that you used along with um, a couple of yours. So, you know, because I mean, I, I would call it an EP if it was just mine, but I would rather just like make like an LP because uh, I know there's at least, well, three of your songs I would expect that you would have played that, that are favorites of mine that I think are some of your best work you've done. But well, what, whatever you want to do. Um, uh, but anyways, Deadfellow said he he's totally up for doing the uh, – the engineering and mastering of that and, and putting it together, um, you know, and, and was going to call it uh, moist man, of course, because <laughs> but for those that, that frequent the uh, Dick sword or discord or whatever it's called um, at the Yona peasants podcast, little, uh, is it my Dick sword page, I guess, but um, server, it's a server. My server. That's what they call yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And I invite people to my server. And is uh, it public or private, by the way? It, it, it's public. Hmm. I'm, I think. All right. I just, I I'm think, wondering how know, long it's going to take you to get one of those. We're going to fucking kick you off warnings. I haven't got one of those yet because I really don't do that much on my dick sword page i mean there's not many or server i'm sorry there's not many pages on my server and the main pages are dank memes and moist keep it moist that's right Adam, yeah, anyway. baby, uh, it's a boy he's he's the uh, the king of moistness <laughs> my good friend ada you know fellow journalist out there well, you know, I, I got to say, B1, I've never, ever seen so much coverage of the Burning Man Festival in my entire life. And I'm of the opinion any press is good press. The hyperbolic stories that came out of Burning Man for three solid days were, were so contrived and over the top. It, I mean, it was just... Hilarious. Again, that you know, when it winded all the way down to cameras zooming in onto dried clumps of playa <laughs> in the Sparks, Nevada, in and out burger parking lot. I've come the fuck on, man. You know, and then you got <laughs> dare I say no, you know, if though, Uncle Sam didn't do a little Yoda. experimenting with the Burning Man Festival. They might have, but it was even better than that on uh, the application formerly known as Twitter because there was a running thread of uh, like retweets where people were posting just like the most dystopian looking pictures that they possibly could of just like complete wastelands and the caption was always something like my friend at Burning Man just sent this Oh man, you know, yeah. Let if there's one thing that we've learned, it's that the news likes hyperbole and exaggeration and sensationalism. And you know, a picture says a thousand words, but 
who's posting those pictures? Who gets to curate these things? Because you could kind of say whatever you want to say with a picture, right? Unless you were there, you wouldn't know that you have everything you need around you at all times. You have everything you need. We had food. We had each other. We had everything. Not not too much different than the real quote unquote real world. To be completely but, uh, honest, that goes for all pretty much all news stories that they go that that they report breathlessly on. They're like, "Well, this happened," and you're like, "Well, what evidence do we have that that actually happened?" Aside from just the fact that you're saying that it happened, half of the new if you look at half of the news stories that they talk about on the news, you're like, "There's I." I don't see any effects of that. It's, you know, it's, I have to take them at their word that that's actually what happened. And it's yeah, like when exactly. you talk about people who died or, or this person shot that person, you know, I think a lot of them are made up. It's exactly. all passed down from one place. It all dribbles down from the same source. Um, Associated Press has something to do with it. And I, I, I wish I could, I wish I had a better memory because I was only reading about this a few weeks ago. Um, I don't want to say it, but um, there's obviously <laughs> a source that it all comes from that's controlled. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. can say whatever you want here, Stella. This is Liberty Radio. We don't censor anybody. Even the people who hate us, we will let them <laughs> come on Friday night, open lines, spew bile at us, and then, you know, hope that they're on their merry way. Just yeah. bear in hey, mind. Which folks, hasn't well, happened hey, yet. Uh, but, you know, you know. I, I, I have to remind people from time to time that Reality isn't just going to manufacture itself. Manufacturingreality.org. I mean, come on. <laughs> you know. Nice. Uh, and when slash it comes provide to hyphen value. Well, this, there's this, this warped that's... perception. You know, it, it's all in how people perceive the world. And, you know, for me, the biggest culture shock of my life had to be leaving the United States as a civilian and actually living overseas as an expat for such a long time and then finishing it off with traveling to Europe and everything else and then and then, and then finishing out with several weeks in Mexico and that long last flying from Chiapas from the Zapatista zone and bouncing skipping through Mexico City and Atlanta back to Chuck Yeager Airport at the John D. Rockefeller Terminal in Charleston, West Virginia. Ah, yes. Home, <laughs> sweet confident. home. Country roads, uh, John Denver. But, uh, you know, when we got back to West Virginia and then got back to Huntington, it was the worst culture shock of my life. Because then and only then was I able to actually make a direct comparison in infrastructure, internet speed, food, fresh access to fresh fruit, and vegetables, transportation options, none of which were available in the United States, nor health care or anything, you know, because, you know, my wife was pregnant and she got several ultrasounds when we were overseas, never asked for passports, never even asked for a fucking name, just age and birthday. Yeah, I mean, you know, birth, you know, and then what, what do you need? And then they just... And it was free, and the medicine was free. It was weird. Free medicine everywhere we went. Everywhere, everywhere except the United States, where we have medical bankruptcies. Sorry, I didn't mean to get off on a tangent there, B1, but this culture shock for me is the fact that in America, it feels so disconnected and so lonely and isolated and more and more by the day. Whereas, you know, when I was living and teaching in Ecuador, even when I was just in Mexico for a couple of weeks, I'm a country dude. I talk to people, you know, and the guy at the bodega that I was getting my cigarettes from and in, in uh, uh, Corzo de Chiapas. And then in uh, when we had that uh, uh, hotel room in um, Tuxla Gutierrez for a week and a half and all the people I kept running into every day and hell, I ended up, you know, getting some weed off one of that dude because we always find each other stoners and shit. But, but you know, they were like um, Mayan and I was Cherokee. And so, you know, we were sharing fucking, and we were powwow. It was fucking great, man. And then I get back to the United States and I can't even hardly connect with my old bandmates in town. Because, and what's the reason? 
everyone's super stressed out about working all the fucking time and just totally broken living day to day. And I mean, just this, there's what's different about the United States for me is this constant struggle and pressure and career and make money. And it just becomes an overwhelming consuming thing to where there's like no quality of life or anything. Whereas when you're in Mexico or when you're in, Italy or Spain or Ecuador, wherever. I mean, quality of life is the thing, you know, being able to go see an opera or listen Shakespeare in the park or hear a, a violins in the fucking square or people singing or, I mean, live bands or going to the market, fresh food. I mean, I'm going on and on here, B1, but to me, Black Rock City and Burning Man, the best parts of it is that it is a microcosm of that type of community of self-sustenance and a consciousness about what you're eating, what you're consuming, and what you're doing with your waste, including poop. True that. Hey, man, that's we're very well put. Yeah. If, if there's if there's one last thing that I could say about this before I hop off here is that yeah you know it Burning Man has taught me several lessons and uh, one of them is that you have a choice at all times to do whatever it is you really feel to do and if there's something you don't want to do you don't have to do it and that's you know the the whole the whole thing with Burning Man is that it's 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 kind of a kind of a portal like it's an accelerated area it's an area of accelerated energy for both good and bad and i think at one time it was probably in a very organic movement and the powers that be like to subvert these <laughs> organic movements because they can't create anything themselves that's kind of the nature of of, of the beast there is that it, it isn't creative they have to hijack other people's creativity and um, out there, there's still a lot of good. There might be some bad, some experimentation, some shit, some fuckery going on. But there's a lot of really uh, amazing people doing amazing things there. And I, I really hope that doesn't go away. Because the whole lesson of Burning Man is to go there, experience a different way of being, and hopefully take some back with you into the quote-unquote real world. And make a change out here that, that make the change that we wish to see. And that's, that's kind of my mission here is with or without burning man. That's what I'm doing anyways, but burning man definitely uh, taught me a few of those lessons. So I hope everybody um, keeps an open mind. Doesn't hop on to what the news is saying w with regards to pretty much anything. And I know that our community is no stranger to that, but um yeah, just don't don't believe everything you hear, and if you feel called, come out to the desert and hang out with us, and you'll 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 see what it's about. And my my last comment would be to you, B one. Um, isn't it kind of obvious when you're out at Burning Man to it, 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 the to distinguish the difference between campers and what I'm going to call pejoratively glamper. <laughs> because there are some that will only camp if glamour camping is an option that's available. For sure. Yeah. Sadly, we, we know who we're talking about yeah. here, B1. We know who we're talking about, but I'm not going to name names. <laughs> well, again, oh, you, we're you talking can, you about Chris them. Rock. Everybody knows we're talking about Chris Rock. Yeah, right? Chris Rock. Okay, secret. yeah, Chris Rock was an example. Right. Name and shame. That Name was and shame. exactly, exactly. That was part <laughs> of the whole thing of it getting out that Chris Rock, you know, went running from Burning Man with his tail between his legs. It's more part of his uh, humiliation ritual now. They did Will Smith, right? They did that back at the Oscars. Now they had to make sure that uh, that Chris Rock got his too. Although maybe it's not as bad. I don't know. But B1, definitely thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us tonight and uh, give us the real dope. 
on what was going down in Black Rock City last weekend. It's my pleasure. I love what you guys are doing, and thank you so much for for keeping me in the loop here with you. Happy to be here any any time. Awesome. You know, I, I, well, I was thinking we'll about you, you the whole time. Thinking about you the whole time, B1. It, Drizzle can tell you, I kept sending him link after link and message after message going on and on about B1 at the Burning Man. So I'm, I'm really glad you had a chance to come in and, and give us this update. And I think this has got to be one of the best examples that we can put up on manufacturingreality.org, uh, really demonstrating the difference between reality on the ground versus the hyperbolic and just albeit warped presentation, or, or should I say misrepresentation of, you know, of what's actually happening out there. Um, and uh, the, the last round of questions is a speed round. Just going to go down a list here uh, real quick because I've got House of God and Galegi. Uh, do you happen to recall playing the track uh, Nigohila, the one with the Kabbali music? Oh, yes. I definitely did, yes. Uh, Nigohila. What about the one that we worked on uh, with uh, Dead Fella? Did you did you play Essence? I did. Yes, the Rem I, I, I played song. probably probably five five of our tracks here that were that were yours. I definitely played the one with Dead Fella. Uh, I played the Vitamin B one. Uh, I played Negohillum. I played, yeah. Uh, pardon me for not recalling all the names right now because they're they're in a, a playlist of mine. But there's yeah, there were probably the five of them that we, that you sent, or for the four that you sent, I think another one. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, 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 played I, them. I think I I think I've got a ball. I think I've got a ball there. Uh, yeah, because you got House of God, which was Dead Fella, and Essence, which okay. was Dead Fella. Yeah, I just want to confirm that because I you know. Um, sure. As with any artist, particularly an underground artist, as you can understand, there are times when it can get um, discouraging, you know, when you feel like, you know, it's just not getting out there. And, you know, I, I, I just really just tried to really just assure dead fella that, you know, please keep making music. We got to keep making tracks, man. Your, your music is great. Oh, he cannot. People are no, sharing Dead Fella stop. and Dr. Dennis and B1 and RBL and yours truly, the Yona. I mean, our music is getting out there. I mean, it Dude, is y'all getting put out the radio. incredible it is getting shit. Distributed. And, and now I can say for certain, because I told him already, I said, man, I told him, you know, a couple of days ago, I was like, Dead Fella, man, B1 going to be banging some of our tracks, some of your music. Like, people are going to be in the desert listening to your music, man. It's, you know, because um, yeah, particularly with YouTube and other places, when you're putting your music out or when you're having a live stream, any more the metrics of how many people are actually listening to your music, or you know, it, it can give you a real warped sense of how much of an audience you're really you know reaching with with the music um and you know as far as i'm concerned and i think you know he said this too really and truly we're just having fun making music and don't really care how many people really hear it or not it's great but n nevertheless for me it's a vibrational thing and that's what's been so cool about working with, you know, you, uh, B1, and with Kingsley, and Dr. Dennis, and and with Dead Fella and others. Because we're separated by such time and, and distance, yet we're all on the same wavelength. We're all on the same vibration. We're all on the same page of music. And that's what I kept thinking of when I kept hearing this shit about Burning Man, that you guys are all pretty much in the same place vibrationally 
like spiritually, oh, yeah, yeah. uh, but not in a religious sense, but like in a really Quantum. like a vibe, a, a vibe, right? In the same oh, yeah. vibe, it's a, I think. It's yeah. a it's a very strange thing. Like we 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 can go on about this another time, but but yeah, it's a it's a big network out there. Like you said, it's like a microcosm, like a mycelium network. And we're yeah. all, everyone there is like two degrees separated. Cause I'm going to say something to you. You're going to turn around and talk to this guy. He's going to talk around and turn to this guy. She'll talk about this with me. And then it just loops back. And we're all very closely connected. And yeah. you'd be surprised, man. There's some strange quantum shit going on out there to where I'll, I'll play a piece of music and immediately somebody will walk up out of nowhere and be like, oh, wow, that's amazing. My grandmother speaks that language. How, where, where, where'd you get that? Oh, that's cool. Cause I know this. It, it's like, it happens immediately. You can put the intention out there and someone will respond to that. You know, out here in a more separated environment, it's a little bit different, but it's it's the same thing. It just happens a little bit slower. Everything happens quicker there. Very quick. Yeah, so, B1, yeah, whatever like you want, uh, go ahead and jump off. Uh, we, or me, uh, I have to keep broadcasting until uh, midnight Eastern because that's our schedule, but Whenever you're good, man, you can go ahead and bounce. You don't have to hang around and wait for the end. <laughs> right on. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna hop off here. I'm gonna tune into it, but I, I do have to hop off the camera here. Right on. But, Thanks uh, for coming, man. But hey, man, it's it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Love you, brother. Good seeing you again. You too. Take care, everyone. Right. Much love, y'all. Thank you for the questions. Can I yes. um pro can I make a proposition? What you're looking it's for. almost, it's just something that sort of came into my mind is because there's all this talk about Jew weapons, Jew weaponry. Who's um, talking is... about it? We weren't talking about it. <laughs> oh, were we here. talking nope, about nope, it? Wasn't us. <laughs> well, you know, globally. Um, so, which is, you know, it's intense power focused in one place, isn't it? So it's almost like what we were just talking about then is is our inversion of that. So I think that's kind of a good way to look at things it's sort of the upside of what they're doing the opposite possibly what they're doing allegedly <laughs> and, and you know stella i don't know if you are a connoisseur of soda pop drinks but um there is a very powerful energizing drink called mountain dew maui blast i know of it i shit you not i shit you mm, not um it's just and, another slap uh, in the face it, it's you know if, if you haven't tried it um don't but you know maybe it's a blast is it well well first of all it's mountain dew so i mean that's kind of gotcha non sequitur for me but um you know you do you yep. mm -hmm. do the do <laughs> <laughs> nothing to see here <laughs> yeah although I think the United States Air Force is coming out with a new version of the Mountain Dew. Um, com coming, uh, <laughs> coming to a spontaneous field near you. There you go. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's good. The, the thing about future time, in a word, it's spontaneity. We've got electric vehicles with spontaneous combustion engines and spontaneous combustion batteries. Mm. We've got fields and yeah it was you know, the electric bikes that started with that spontaneous trend. combustion um wind turbines falling nato. down fire nato that that's what caused the burn circles fire natos they're like shark natos but instead of flying sharks it's fires <laughs> yeah hey uh can i jump in hey sure. awesome. Hey, so first of all, I want to say what's up to Yona. This is my first time talking to you. I've seen you in the chats, of course. So I'll that's cool. And hello to Drizzle, Fido, and Stella. Hey, uh, hey. Ashley. Hey. Well, hello. Uh, I just was going to ask if y'all had seen, because we're talking about like the do stuff and that kind of thing, like the, that somebody online was saying that three tropical storms slash hurricanes are going to merge together in the Atlantic and hit New York. Is that those ones? It would be the East coast. Um, so yeah. yes, probably New York, but a whole bunch of other stuff too. <laughs> 
I just wow. something about that. It's like they're uh, they've put it onto eleven. They put the weather machine onto eleven. You know. You know, it, it turns out yes. actually, uh, El Corresponsal, aka your correspondent here, not only covers <laughs> current events and historical deep dives, but uh, I also dabble in the meteorology, and I think Drizzle can attest. Love to, to hear uh, it. I, I I be sending him links, uh, and I've been talking up the Hurricane Lee quite okay. a bit over the last 48 hours with the drizzle here since, since yeah, it's so breaking we'll, records um you so know the you other think? two hurricanes that are basically fish storms in this mid-atlantic it will be interesting to see because i idalia is still out there and so i mean yeah right now we have three named hurricanes that are in the atlantic but i don't know how they're going to interact and of course right now um possible landfall with the uh east coast of north america there is it is that earliest at least a week out it would be at least until next friday until we could see a possible landfall by this record-breaking monster hurricane lee that is currently due northeast of um, St. Martin's. Uh, uh, and, you know, which if you're not familiar with St. Martin's, it's right next to the U.S. and British Virgin Islands. So uh, the little St. James Island, Epstein's pedophile island, it's, it's mm -hmm. due northeast of that about. 250 miles or basically a, about a 20 minute jet ride in Lolita Express would get you to the eye of the storm from Epstein's Island. Um, and right now the track is supposed, it, it's, it's just making a B line straight for Jacksonville, Florida, but it's expected to turn to the North and hit this uh, dip in the jet stream. Uh, and so sometime Early next week, we're going to find out whether or not it's going to plow through Bermuda and fuck up Martha's Vineyard and make landfall like around Boston or uh, maybe a little bit further up like Kenny Bunkport, Maine. Or, or does it make a lower landfall and actually hit like the mouth of the Hudson, you know, Staten Island, New York City, um, like Sandy, uh, yeah, that remains to be seen, you know, because you've got the steering currents with the highs and the lows. And well, the the oh. little thing that I read wherever it was and wherever whatever it was um, was mm -hmm. basically saying <laughs> that New York New York was just about to be demolished. So uh, who knows? Interesting. Who yeah, knows? because perhaps it's looking... another example of that beautiful hyperbolic mainstream thinking, yeah. we were talking about earlier, Stella. And it depends who's got the joystick, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Through that. Well, I think it's still a bit early to uh, say exactly where it's going to make landfall at this point, <clears throat> based on what we were just looking at on the radar, because it's way far away from New York City right now. I do think it's yeah, worthwhile well pointing out. Scare people. Sorry about that. That one uh, of the uh, primary uh, fuels, as it were, for hurricanes is a uh, sea surface temperature and the immediate subsurface temperature of the sea. And in that regard, the Gulf of Mexico traditionally has always been a hot spot in terms of waters on planet Earth, uh, as well as around the Caribbean, you know, the, the major Antil Antilles. Uh, not so much when you get past the Leeward Islands going down below Barbados toward Trinidad and Tobago. But nonetheless, this year, it's the hottest recorded sur uh, sea surface temperatures ever along the Florida coast, all the way up to the Outer Banks, uh, you know, along North Carolina, uh, as well as all around, uh, you know, the Virgin Islands and, and then the entirety of the Gulf of Mexico is it's basically like bathtub water, 88, 90, in some places, 90 degrees. And so that has led to this 
repeat phenomenon now, four hurricanes in a row that have started out as just fledgling tropical depressions and have experienced what's called rapid intensification, where they go from sustained winds of 35 or 40 miles an hour to hurricane force sustained winds in some cases of 125, 130, 140 miles an hour, you know, getting into cat three, cat four status. Um, and well, now, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask y'all that have done the studying the weather modification stuff. I know Stella's done a ton of it. Um, do you think that they can make hurricanes stronger? Now, I do want to remind people, not that this hasn't been going on longer, but here in the Southeast in 1989, it was actually September 22nd of 1989, uh, Hurricane Hugo was a category four hurricane that landed, um, made landfall in Charleston and scooped all the way up to Western North Carolina and beyond, did a ton mm -hmm. of damage to be that far inland. So it's not, and two years after that was uh, Andrew that made landfall mm -hmm. in Florida as a category five. So and I know there there's other history well before that of category five storms, but do y'all think that they can make them stronger now? I well, would they, say, uh, yes, yeah, they can create <laughs> weather patterns. We know that this is, this is technology they've that they've it. had since the mid 20th century. So if they mm -hmm. can do that, they can absolutely influence the existing weather patterns. 100%. And um, I was just going to say to Yono, um, you, you were talking about the different, you know, heat, the places where there's heat um, and how that influences mm -hmm. the pathways, I guess. Um, so I'm just saying, like, this is sort of statistics, like uh, temperatures and everything that you're hearing, that all that new, all that um, reports of statistics of, of all that stuff is all basically coming from NOAA. It's sort of like the news, you know, that all comes from one spot. Well, all this stuff comes from one spot as well, sort of basically Noah and maybe a few other places, I'm not sure, but that's sort of the central. So that's what we are told. And I'm just purely chucking this out there, spitballing. Um, so just imagine if we're told one thing, but that's sort of covering, you know, I mean, it's I'm sort of stating the bleeding obvious, really. That's sort of covering the, manip the manipulation because – guaranteed it's being manipulated there are businesses out there who are weather manipulation businesses who guarantee that your daughter's going to have a fine day for her wedding um australianrain.com.au you can go there and they talk about the experiments they've been doing so there's no denial it's going on and um yeah i just wonder how much of the statistics are saying this but that sort of covers their activity, if you know what I mean. And then that, they that can go, really, oh, this is unprecedented because everything's always so fucking unprecedented. That's a really, really salient point um, to make there. And I mean, uh, you know, non sequitur, you know, my, my profession through my life has been as a land surveyor and civil engineer. So, you know, when I approach uh, meteorology and, and data sets, you know, I approach it with the same skepticism of any other data set. And I will say in particular, when it comes to the data, uh, the data sets that produce the maps uh, uh, showing the uh, sea surface temperatures. Mm -hmm. Of course, NOAA has weather buoys, weather balloons, and they also coordinate flights with the hurricane hunters that will actually send planes to fly into the eyes of hurricanes to gather more uh, temperature, uh, pressure data, and to see how much of a drop in barometric pressure there is in the eye to gauge the strength of the storm. Mm. Stuff I'd like imagine that. they use. But, I'd imagine they use drones for that now. Uh, well, no, they still they they still have to use the hurricane hunter. Um, planes that fly into the eye because of the uh, turbulence um because it's right. it's right. a they, you know they call it the vomit comet flying those planes <laughs> they're right. tossed around so badly but uh uh in particular it's actually um i'm trying to think the the national geospatial agency which provides satellite imagery real-time mm -hmm. 
for uh, DOD and Pentagon and other people. Um, it's yeah. a whole other branch of the government, in fact, um, geospatial agency. Um, and they have special uh, constellation of satellites mm -hmm. that yep. are reading um, surface temperature um, with infrared. Um, and that's where the data from the sea surface temperatures are. But now when it comes to subsurface temperature readings, we only have those off of the United States Geological and Coastal Survey buoys. And that data is given to NGS National Geological Survey. And that is then collated with the other data sets that is then sent from NOAA, NGS, and Geospatial, National Geospatial. And all that info is then sent down to Miami at the National Hurricane Center, where they then build their um, models, they models, models, and stuff yeah. like that. And so, I, I the point models. you make about the data sets is, you know, some of the wonky numbers are are coming from the Coast Guard and from the Geospatial Agency because you'll see in what we get from the Coast Guard buoy data, oftentimes will vary considerably from what the satellites are supposedly detecting. From yes. Right, exactly. Yeah. So I, I, I just want to back up what you were saying there. It, 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 it's not only a salient point, it's accurate. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that information. And But, yeah, it always seems to go through a filter, doesn't it? So, um, I mean, that was part of also, I wish I was hopeless at remembering where I can't keep everything because I'm just um, – but, yeah, anyway, whatever it was, it was like they were talking about um, – like you said, there's some smaller places where they get their information from and how, yeah, there had been a, well, let's just say bribes. I'll just say mm -hmm. it. <laughs> That's the word. So lots of that goes on. Um, and also, as I said, like, yeah, it goes through a filter. So it's sort of being customised into whatever the narrative is that's coming up because let's face it, they're well and truly well planned in advance for what's going to happen. Not None of this is really very spontaneous. So, um, yeah, it's just a point to consider. Um, and it also has sometimes... been strange. Um, mm -hmm. It's been really strange to see this whiplash weather pattern, whiplashing from extreme yeah. drought and water shortages and rationing to water over the spill, emergency spillways again. I, and I'll mm -hmm. just give uh, three examples, right? Um, when we look at California, right, and uh, uh, those great, great lakes, where you got what Folsom Lake, and, and what's the the other two big lakes, uh, Lake Oroville and Lake Shasta. And, and anyways, um, you know there was an absolute panic in California because all these lakes were just basically down to mud. Like, in, in, for it's example, Lake California. Shasta has an ancient rail line that goes along the edge of the Sacramento River that is normally 200 feet underwater. And for some reason, when they built Lake Shasta, they just left the entire rail line in place with the steel trestle bridges and tunnels and everything where it hugs the bank of the Sacramento River. So very strangely, whenever which it only, it had only happened once before when the water was low enough where you could even see the remnants of the old rail line. But anyways, it was went from mud to sending water over the emergency spillway, all of the ones in California. Same thing. Second example would be um, down in Arizona and Nevada with uh, the Colorado River system and the water impounded behind Hoover Dam in what is called Lake Mead. You know, Lake Mead was at its lowest level ever yeah. since Hoover Dam has been built. Now, yeah, now we're, now, now we're all so good, low, and Yona. it just keeps going up and up and up and up. They just yeah. keep getting rain after rain after rain. And Lake then Mead another example so would be Australia around um, yep, the uh, Gold Dam. Coast yeah. and, you know, uh, I mean, from yeah. Queensland to Canberra, to Sydney, to Melbourne, the White Mountains. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, Blue Mountains. The Blue um, Mountains. Yep. The Blue <laughs> Don't Mountains. Be racist. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's been 
staggering to see. Again, it's like a whiplash going from these and, extreme droughts to just repeated, repeated, yep. um, just rocks, Un- unprecedented, rains, yep. and unprecedented willy, willy. after unprecedented after unprecedented. It's like, let's see how more unprecedented we can get, you know? Yeah. Let's step it up a notch every time, you know? Well, That's what with it feels the, like. The, the cyclones or, or I guess – Willy willies in Australia. I guess we here we would call them twisters. Oh no, we get cyclones. Um, but I mean willy willies like the dust ups and such. You know, mm-hmm. um, yeah, the one on top of the Rockies was surreal. Do you see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On top of the Rockies, at at what fifteen thousand feet? Make 18, it thousand. I don't know. Yeah. Make so it, I wanted to. I wanted to throw this out there for uh, to see what y'all thought about this. Two things. So I believe it was the Ice Age farm. No, it was definitely the Ice Age farmer that said that we're headed into a grand solar minimum. Correct. And so as part of the normal cycle. He's not of the like, only one. Right. Okay. So as part of the normal cycle that we will head into a cooler period and in the transition period, then you will have this really crazy weather. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's one thing I wanted to hear what y'all thought about. And the other thing was the um, drizzle. Do you remember when I sent you the space weather news guy, like the suspicious observers who was talking about the magnetic field of the earth as weakening. um, And you were like, Basically, he said that you wouldn't follow him on Twitter because he was kind of fear, fearish. Mm, but yeah, basically, yeah, yeah. he was saying, okay, so that, those are just two things that I was thinking about that because he did say that it the weakening magnetic field could also affect the weather and cause the weather to get warmer mm-hmm. or the water to get warmer and maybe even for like the Gulf Stream to basically stop. Well, the mag- the magnetic field affects everything on the Earth, like literally every. It affects us too. So, if there are changes occurring in the magnetic field of the planet, you can then expect changes to occur in everything on the planet. That includes weather patterns. That includes people's thought patterns. Like it, it's everything. And the thing is from a lot of the sources that I follow, it's not just on earth that these changes are happening. It's happening on all of the other planets in the solar system. If you believe that space is real, if you don't believe that space is real, then that doesn't matter. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I wanted to hear what y'all thought about that because I'm still like, maybe this guy is, maybe he's wrong, but maybe he's not. Well, the, the people who pay attention to like watching the other planets in the solar system on the regular basis, because I don't do that. um, They're saying that they're seeing changes in the atmospheres of other planets like specifically uh neptune i think was was the last one that i heard that they had seen a dramatic shift in uh the the atmosphere on neptune at least as far as you know what they were able to see or whatever may i ask who who they is that you're referring to i can't you talking about nasa this point right okay well, I, I, I consume something a lot that's important of to point data, out. Stella. I understand. I'm totally with you there. <laughs> I think so I much that's Drizzle, important. I'm sure, may recall from the great rap artist Drake when he said, uh, I gave you the world, but there's other planets too. Um, you know, I kept hearing about planets as a child. And so uh, I looked up Uranus and turns out there's rings around it and <laughs> two large moons. It's for real. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> Can I can I just step in there, Ashley? I'll I'll just give you my um my thing. I've wondered about this guy, suspicious observer, right? Like I I'm not a hundred percent on board with him. I've watched him a few times, and I, I do tend to think there's a little bit of fear mongering there, and I think that's just his angle is the space one. But because I'm 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 very dubious about the whole space thing. I just NASA, you know, a bunch of bloody you know where the the foundation of NASA it comes from, so I don't really believe anything. I think it's just a big money laundering thing. But anyway, um, I wanted to ask you, Yona, um, 
<laughs> the magnetic this magnetic field thing that everyone's talking about the polar shifts and all this stuff you know I'm I don't know I'm not a scientist so I just have this little thing of a, a bit of a theory here with with um you know how the auroras were really, really visible recently, like in mm -hmm. places that you don't normally see them. Right. Well, much. we've had those uh, meteor showers too. Yeah. I just, I just wondered. I've just been wondering how whether they are actually organic or whether there's something more going on in the sense of like we've got with the geoengineering. Like, just quickly bring this in with the geoengineering. We've got. You know, you've got your chemtrails. That's a whole sort of different story to the contrails mm -hmm. because the contrails are like they're not like intentionally created. Well, that, that that's a fractional story, but let's just stick with the basics. They're not in that they're a result of commercial airlines and, of course, military. I mean, they're the worst polluters on the planet. Um, so what's happening is even though you, we might not be seeing actual lines, etc., there is a mist. It's the contrails all converge and it creates a veil basically. Mm -hmm. And um, you know that's been going on for a very long time, and it's it's a little bit hard to see. But then you know you talk to older people, and they say, yeah, you know it, the sky didn't look like this when I was a child, and you know it's not really rich blue, and you can just see this veil sometimes. And um, I've just wondered, you know, bringing the Project Blue Beam thing into it, you know, like this veil is creating basically a projection screen. So that kind of was crossing my mind with the whole Aurora sort well, of thing. Well, it's like, is this you... some incredibly massive experiment? Because they do say it's going to be like on global scale when uh, they do this I, I can tell you from my own experience in land surveying, you know, um, every single survey that I've ever done when I first set up the tripod and mount the transit with the telescope and the laser beam and all that stuff, Mm -hmm. I then stand behind the transit with a magnetic compass and sight magnetic north so I can then uh, establish a, a magnetic observation for that day to, to try to ascertain declination from true north, which would be astronomic north. And, you know, when I first began doing surveying with my granddad, Probus, we would actually wait till night and then sight Polaris with a timepiece and mm -hmm. determine latitude and longitude with astronomic observations. But then by the time I was 15, we got our first uh, GPS receivers, static receivers, and we would actually set up three receivers so that we could then triangulate position triangulate, on yep. the ground with three sets of XYZ coordinates uh, to then have a closed horizontal and vertical loop between the three receivers. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the data was only as precise as the, uh, what's called the ephemeral angles, you know, or, you know, the horizon angles uh, mm -hmm. of the ephemeris, which is your constellation of satellites overhead. So what's interesting is uh, how the ground and other buildings will affect the uh, needle on the compass. There are so many things that can affect the needle on the magnetic compass when you're trying to get a true north reading. And so I, whenever I go to do my first magnet, magnetic observation at my initial setup on tripod, I always have to be careful to not be close to buildings, to not be underneath power lines, to not be overneath a metal gas pipeline or anything like that to try to be in a natural area. And with all that being said, I've been doing magnetic observations, running magnetic compass lines many times where I'll start at one point and have to flag a, a rural knob track that's just timber land so that a uh, logger can go out there and timber their side of the line. And the boundary may run for a half mile in a straight line, just up and down. And I go out there with a magnetic compass and I'll notice as I go over a creek or some areas where there's minerals in the ground, it, you'll actually see the, the, the needle being pulled or steered away. Hmm. And so I, I bring this up because the last Three times I did magnetic observations because I helped my brother occasionally on surveys here in Huntington. 
and I and I ran compass line uh, using some deeds and maps because I was out there with a metal detector wand trying to find the old pins and pipes in this prior survey. So I'm using the compass. And I noticed like the variation is like eight degrees declination. And in this area, it was traditionally about four or five. The part I was at in Kentucky, it was about six. Well, um, the last time I was in Kentucky about a month ago, just for shits and giggles, I got out my compass and sighted our baseline at our old survey office. And the declination was nine degrees. And so I'm like, what the hell is going on? I've never. Now, when I talk about declination, I'm talking about where magnetic north is showing on the compass is actually nine degrees easterly of the north arrow. But in the course of a month, it's now declining up to nine degrees both ways. So when I say there's a magnetic declination of up to nine degrees, it's actually, think of it like tides, like high tide, low tide, but with mm -hmm. the magnetic field. And so it, it, it's actually swinging up to 18 degrees in central Kentucky, and it's swinging up to 12 degrees here in Huntington locally the magnetic field, which to me indicates that the magnetic field is weakening when the needle is able to drift that much. It's not got enough positive force keeping it to keep it in on yeah. to the North. If you, uh, hopefully you, under, you, you get what I'm yeah. driving here with totally. all of my observations over my career since 1982 however many years that 41 years <laughs> jesus christ yeah no it's great to hear some boots on ground type information because i've, I've wondered for you know quite a long time whether it's something another thing they're just having us on about or you know how they can really measure it and i, I haven't actually thought that much about like magnetic pollution like you're talking about like light what's pollution. really got exciting to go, got to get out and go somewhere really dark and i suppose you'd also have to know have a fairly good geological understanding of different places so you know so that you're not like standing on an ironstone mountain or what have you right right yeah and that makes a big difference but the, yeah. to me the most exciting thing about magnetic fields and magnetism are all of the patented products injectable products uh with magneto ferritin <laughs> lipid nanoparticles uh mm -hmm. and um you know there have been some pretty crackpot uh conspiracy theories put out there um I'm thinking of you, Stu Peter, <laughs> specifically. Stu but Peters. Award-winning, you know, Yona. The award-winning Stu Peters. The award-winning. That's yes. right. <laughs> Shout out mm -hmm. to uh, my good friend there with his Bridie on stuff there. Um, his name escapes me right now. The good the good uh, doctor there. But uh, um, is it Mike Adams? Yeah, you're talking anyway, about the health uh, ranger. Yeah, the health ranger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's him. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, right. It's a bit of a fear monger. But uh, you know, because you know he's put out the theory that they're like, uh, what are they like, self assembling into Sony Walkmans or something, or or and and that's because of the snake venom that mixes with the. I think they use AAA bat. No, watch batteries. No, no, no. The they're, they're powered by the demon cells. That's right. Because there's the demon cells. The Luciferase. The Luciferase. Which, which interact with the Luciferase, which is yeah. a photophosphorescent. That way, when they examine your strains of DNA, the the new and improved DNA strains actually glow because they've got the Luciferase, and that way they know. Oh. Yeah, we looked at your DNA under a microscope, and it turns out um, we fucking own your ass. Mm. Just like the neighbor's cornfield that got cross-pollinated with our... Yes, BT like a, you've been trademarked. Mm. And that's that's our BT corn pollen, and, you know... Well, I think... So we own your crop, too, motherfucker. The, the trademark think, of the beast. I don't think they're even going to have to go that far, Yona. Because... 
look at it look at it from this perspective all right so they have uh, a segment of the population now whose immune system is declining and will one day eventually be completely gone if it hasn't happened already those people are going to require pharmaceutical intervention for the rest of their lives because they can't fight off any infection anymore. Nothing. Not even a common cold. They will have no fair, immune Google? system. Yeah, to be completely uh, fair, Google, we already have people who are completely dependent upon pharmaceuticals to stay alive. Yeah, I'm mean, pardon my friend. Backing up what Fido said, and I, I don't mean to be insensitive, but no. this is absolutely wonderful news because when I hear lifetime customers, I smell the money, Jerry Maguire. Mmm, delicious profits. <laughs> yeah, they um here um I can't remember when it was, uh, about a, a few years ago. I read an article where they were talking about how um, with uh, kidney transplants, um, patients who are who ha whose kidneys have failed to the point where they have to have dialysis to keep their blood filtered because their kidneys aren't doing it anymore, they're on dialysis, and people are usually referred for um, kidney transplant. And the thing is, though, if they get the kidney transplant, they no longer need dialysis. They do need expensive anti-rejection meds and that they have to take for the rest of their life um and so a lot of people just choose to stay on dialysis because um it's it is cheaper than going with the anti-rejection meds and there are i mean I, I think the complications are probably similar um both have very similar life-threatening complications that can arise from either avenue but um I mean, they, they put people on this di on the dialysis and granted when they first, when, when dialysis was first invented, it took all day. It took like, I think 16 hours and the machine was the size of, um, probably, uh, I don't know, five, 600 square foot room. It was a huge machine and it took all day. And now you have a small refrigerator size machine um, that does it in a matter of hours and that's how far it's come. But now it's to the point where they basically just keep people on dialysis and they kind of lead them down the garden path. Oh, well, we'll just do it for a little while longer. Make sure your kidney function gets to where it needs to be. And then we can talk about that, uh, kidney transplant. And I, my brother-in-law is actually, he's one of these people he's, He's on. He's doing the peritoneal, which is um, fluid that he um, infuses fluid into his abdominal cavity, and then through osmosis, it filters the toxins out of his uh, body into that fluid in his abdomen, and then he drains it out. And it takes all day, and he has to do this multiple times a week. He's able to do it in the comfort of his home, um, but right when they were talking about actually doing his kidney transplant. This is when COVID hit and nobody was getting transplants. I mean, only those the sickest of the sick were actually getting the transplants. And so now he's never going to get a transplant because he has developed complications from having to do um, all this dialysis. And it's, they, they don't, I don't think they accurately tell p people what to expect with diet when it comes to dialysis, but these people are, literally dependent upon the healthcare system to stay alive because if it wasn't for the dialysis centers these people would be dead from kidney failure and 